Now, I'm delighted to say Keith Wood is with us. Keith, good morning to you. How are you? I'm very good, sir. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. Um, we, there's a couple of big stories that we should uh, talk about. Um, finally, the entire country is united behind Ron O'Gara and La Rochelle this weekend because if La Rochelle beats Toulouse in the final, then uh, Munster fans will be happy because it's one of their own doing really well. And Leinster fans are going to be happy as well because in the newly fixed or nearly fixed uh, European Champions Cup Leinster are back into top seeds as a uh, result of uh, being beaten by La Rochelle um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the actual new pool system but we're getting back to something slightly better if it's not still quite fixed no no I, I was I, I will admit I kind of really lost the will to go on um, when I was trying to read it uh, competition should be very simple Um but none of this is simple. There's um, different teams can't be in different groups. Different teams don't play against different groups. Um, it's trying to find a mix that suits everybody. And it's a compromise that I think is a, just a little bit frustrating still. I mean, ever since they've tinkered with it. And it wasn't perfect before. And I know we often think it was. It was absolutely beneficial to the Irish teams the way it was before. Um um, partly because the Irish teams were always guaranteed to be in it and um, um, uh, by playing in it every single year you get used to it and you understand it a bit more and um, it was different then on, in almost a pure meritocracy for the other teams but now there's so many teams that are in it um, it is chopping and changing consistently um, they haven't it right, I think, but I, I think they need to get it right over the next couple of years just to try and have it where it, it is seamless. Now, and the reason I say that previously it wasn't right, there were a few dead rubbers and there was a few French teams who didn't take the games seriously enough. Um, but in the last year, teams didn't take uh, some of the matches seriously enough because they didn't have to. They only they could have qualified by winning one match, pretty much. So I think this looks a little bit better, um, but it's a work in progress. It's definitely a work in progress. Is it going to be a seeding system on the basis of different teams playing each other and results? And it's kind of difficult to see exactly how that's going to end up working out. Whereas previously, you had uh, two teams coming out of groups. Now the issue there was that if you got drawn with one of the Italian sides it was a routine five points and that ended up skewing who got home advantage the Italian teams aren't automatically qualifying anymore and it did like the, the main problem is that they've taken out a couple of rounds and it, rugby is the only sport where the European competition is getting fewer games than the domestic competition it does feel as if they still kind of quite haven't worked out the whole economics of if we play more big games we'll get more people to come to them and we should be generating more revenue off the back of that well, look, when we start talking revenue, which I think we're going to discuss a few other parts, uh, for for the Premiership and for um, for the French Championship, they don't get paid as much money for European. It isn't it isn't as valuable for them. And uh, for the elements of this that are a business, there's a, a large requirement for that to be the case. Um, but I think. I think it's all going to change within England anyway, with the English Premiership going to be down to 10 teams. Um, should they automatically get the same number of teams into into the competition? That doesn't seem right either, because it's supposed to be meritocracy, but it's the top eight. Um, so that's top eight out of 10 seems a little bit uh, top heavy. Um, look, I, I just think it's, I think this year, I think the World Cup will take over a huge amount of concentration. Um, and I think there'll be an awful lot of back-channeling conversations to try and figure out where rugby can go at the present moment in time. And at times we seem, it's funny, I've looked at a couple of the, the notice boards and this uh, people seem to be saying, well, look, Ireland's in great shape and um, almost glorying in the fact that other teams are going or it's not as, as good in England or elements of, of that we need all the countries to be strong we need all the teams to be strong for it to be a viable sustainable um, series of competitions so um, rugby has to have some level of a reset and we discussed this at, at, at lockdown um, when we were trying to figure out what we were what we were supposed to talk about and that the idea was there for a reset but what has happened since is it's become 
um, more financially skewed, more financially strained, um, and I, th I think we're in a kind of strange period of time for the next couple of years. So, look, I love the European competition. The Irish teams have embraced it more than anyone. Some of the French teams have, some of the English teams have. Um, there is there is a financial model. There has to be through Europe and with Europe. It is. Um, we know it from the crowds that turn up for those matches. We know it for the rivalries that have have gone gone over the history. Like we talked about Ron Nagar at the start. You know, he was Mr. European Cup, he still is, and it, it was built on huge series of different rivalries with Munster and Gloucester, with Munster and Leinster, you know, with with Toulouse, with with Leinster and everybody, with Toulon, you know, there was huge, huge competition, huge rivalries that were built up that get 30, 40, 50,000 people through the gate, and that's what's required. It, like, it, the money is obviously the huge thing here, Keith, and, and certainly when you come to the Champions Cup structures, that's one of the rationales behind it, and TV viewers viewership obviously matters as well, but Jeopardy is, is what sport is all about. And you look at this new structure and you're thinking, well, if you win a couple of your games, two of your games, you get into the round of 16, basically, mismatched opponents at that stage. Like I know the, the rugby purist loves the, the old Heineken Cup, model um, like th th you're even looking at them picking four groups of six teams like could they not have gone for six groups of four teams yes you could like, well the winners go through Maybe two best runners to, up then it's the two games it's the two extra games they've taken out of yeah that well, that's the thing but like I mean is Jeopardy not the, the be all and end all, all here Keith above the money um, I think Jeopardy is I look I do think if you look at the um, if you look at the European Cup this year all the home teams won except at the very end mm. you know and um, so there isn't, there often isn't that much jeopardy. It, it just hasn't worked as well. Um, look, I think there's a bigger question to this than just the the, the European Cup. Um, we've said this, you know, when we were trying to figure out rugby, I think it was during the lockdown, sure, we were having lots of conversations over sustainability, both in terms of travel um, and in terms of financial. And the uh, uh, sustainability in terms of player welfare and the length of the season and all those different component parts. Um, if the season is 42 or 44 weeks long, it's too long. So there has to be a coordinated effort between the leagues. It has to be better than it is at the moment. There's still it's too many people kind of fighting their corner uh, that much. At times, it sounds like it's going to get better. And in, in some countries, it's better. In some countries, it's a shambles at the moment. And the viability of this is, should you have squads of 55, 60 people so that you can play all these games? And then when you do have a squad of that size, are the players play, uh, match hardened enough to be able to play at the, at the end of the season? Um, is it financially viable in the first place? If you look at Wales, it's... The salary cap has gone so low. Um, uh, it's a very interesting decision. It's going. It's like going back to the early days of professionalism. The decision is: Do you work or do you play rugby? You know, and, and it may be better off to work. Yeah, so. yeah. Wales is is, is a, like a whole hour long uh, program to get into it. But uh, Gatlin was talking during the week, and I, d I don't know if it's a stereotypical Warren Gatlin like. If he's just lobbing grenades because that's what he does, but he was saying that he wouldn't have taken the gig if he'd known how bad things were. And um, Kathy was pointing out pre-show, he's pretty well connected in Wales. He kind of knows yeah. he knows the crack. That's a that's a, I, look. I thought it was an, a very interesting um, interview, and but it's as if he went into the job without uh, taking any view on what was going on there at all. And I think most people would do that, and he would be very well connected there. Um, he tried to explain why some of the players were leaving. Um, some of those made sense. I think there's an element of lobbing grenades. I think there's an element of taking pressure off the team, which he does consistently, and taking pressure off himself. And um, But yeah, it's, it was kind of an unusual element, really. And I thought he was quite harsh on young Hawkins, who had... Um, we don't know the circumstances, but for a guy who's 20 years of age, he may not have been offered a big contract and he may have been offered a big contract elsewhere. And if 
you were talking and working in a company that was debating going on strike in the middle of it and somebody offered you a very good contract elsewhere, I think you might go there. So, um, um, like, sport is very unusual. The emotional tug to sport is um, it just singles it out as being something unique in um, in life, really. And you can go for your dreams with it. It's been funny. I've been you know talking to a couple of young players recently and describing what rugby can be for them if they wanted it as a as a as a career. And it's pretty much an internship for the rest of their life because you could play rugby for 10 or 12 years and retire at 30 years of age and then you have another 35 years to work. So what has rugby given you in that period of time to be able to build it out for the next 35 years? You know, so you can start your the rest of your life a little bit later than you normally would. That's just a, that's a way of looking at it because it's so fraught at the present moment in time with injury, with financial concerns with the, the potential of clubs like any person who signs on with a club and suddenly they go out of business that's pretty that's a pretty horrendous uh, situation but we know it happens all the time in real world yeah well let's talk about London Irish then because that situation has just happened um, we were speaking to one of the players recently and he was he was bringing up um, uh, I think it was Declan Danaher who's, whose wife also was an employee of the club and they have a, a young family and you know these are the, the stories that you, you don't think about when the headline stuff in the club and the debt and whether or not they're going to be able to play next season but then that collapses and all of a sudden there that's all that's left is the stories of the, the staff who are working there um, we'd spoken before about whether or not it was the right thing to do for the IRFU to get involved um, you know notwithstanding their difficulties they had been in, in we're told from the, the Telegraph certainly it's, it's mostly the English um, rugby journalists reporting on this that there had been some preliminary discussions around potentially saving the club as a, a championship club involving the IRFU. I thought it made sense always. Like a, I know you'd have to make the money work, but I'm sure that there are very smart people who would be able to tap into the Irish diaspora in London, very high net worth individuals over there, who you could build as a bridge with Irish rugby. So I don't know, what's your, what's your feeling about this whole thing now? Yeah, I, look, I still... Look, I think London Irish moved away from its Irish roots when it moved to Sunbury. And I think that kind of broke, or moved away from Sunbury out to Reading. And I think that kind of broke uh, some of that link. If you look at the team uh, at the moment, there are very few Irish involved in it. Um, I think in stepping away from it, it makes it harder to do that. I also think within the or the RFU, um, having a team that is there ostensibly to develop Irish players, if the IRFU were to take a stake in it or take control of it, would be incredibly problematic. So part of the uh, the remit of the Premiership is to develop players to play for England. And I don't know that they'd want um, one of their main competitors uh, on their turf doing doing something similar. And I think that could be short-sighted uh, or not. I think there's merit in there because I think we are generating a fairly huge number of players um, in Ireland with only four um, four professional teams. So, uh, look, I, I do think there's merit in it. Of course I do. And I do think, um, like one of the first games I, I played with with, uh, with Munster um, was uh, against the Exiles in London Irish. And it was a mixture of the two of those. And uh, playing with Gary Owen over there with them back in the early 90s. So, it's it is a it is a long proud history, but I don't think you can just talk about London Irish. I don't think it ends at London Irish. Um, I think there's a lot of clubs under pressure. Um, there, the amount of money that the owners are putting in um, is averaging four million a year on top of everything the clubs are making. So that is not sustainable. It's stark as well, Keith. When you when you look at the the Saudi involvement in golf and even at Newcastle and the money that um, Premier League football clubs are spending on players at the minute, when you compare it to rugby, it it it, it nearly highlights it. And, and it's a scary thought in some ways. I don't know if it if it speaks to where rugby is at at the moment. And and you see that this, the club's struggling, of course, in the English Premiership financially. But it, it's not in a good place. No, and I don't I don't go for the comparisons. I don't think. 
they're I, I think they're big sports and I, I think at times we try and drive the idea that rugby is um, is as big it isn't it's a complicated game um, there's been a huge amount of tinkering with the laws over the last number of years there's an, and even when we're talking about qualifications for Heineken Cup or European Cup or who gets out of what group or where or who plays who um, football is incredibly easy the laws are pretty simple um, the rules are rules in, in soccer the rules are simple the um, it's easy to play no, great players play, make it look very easy, and they can. Um, great players can bring the game to an entirely different level. But it's a simple game that everybody can go and play. Rugby isn't that, and rugby still is niche. It's it's very big within the areas that it is big, if that makes sense. So in the, within the established countries that play it, um, and it also is a very attractive commercial venture for sponsors. Um, but it's an incredibly attritional game. And so the idea of playing for the whole year means you need much bigger squads. Um, I mean, I think we're at a really strong inflection point. I mean, I'm not giving any solution here. I, I, I think we said recently that, you know, the game can't afford to pay the salaries it's paying. Um, but I don't know whether players should play for less than those you know it's one of those absolute um, impasse where um, if you have someone who's on a couple of hundred grand a year and you say that's a good salary that's that's great and they the next salary is 50,000 is it worth it then if that becomes the question it was the question that was there at the start of professionalism it actually has come back to that point again another question uh, Keith is have we missed a trick with Jean Klein or is it is it all nice and relaxed he's, he's obviously gone off to South Africa um, is it mind games from Razi Erasmus is he trying to get in our heads uh, I think that would be probably overstepping it a little um, I, I know Jerry you asked me a question about Jean Klein about how he played a couple of weeks ago and whether he'd get into the Ireland squad I didn't see him getting into the Ireland squad um, I I said I don't know that he suited what it was that Ireland wanted to do um, and I said that his strengths are his pinning of the um, of the scrum um, his huge work rate which is, has become huge I have to say he's, his amount of his tackling his work in the mall um, uh, his, you know, he's constantly um, in, he, he's in every ruck. He doesn't ball carry as much, and I think he's better without ball carrying much. And I think he fits into the South African system um, better than he fits into the Irish system. So I wasn't certain he'd get into the squad. I was very surprised to see him go into the South African squad, and and that change in law was do done and designed entirely for Tier Two teams. It was. Actually, the, the case in point was Issa Nasewa, um, who played 15 minutes for New Zealand and then never got to, to play for Fiji afterwards. It was He was a case in point. And with so many teams um, um, picking players from different countries over the years and, um, and then when their time was up, which could be up pretty soon, the rest of their career mightn't be there. That was the rationale behind it. And I think that was a fairly decent rationale to try and bring up the standard of tier two. I still think you should, you know, you have to, you should make one decision and play for one country. I don't think you should be chopping and changing countries, but, um, but it wasn't done for tier one to tier one. So for me, I was very surprised with that. And I don't think it was done for that reason. But um, for John Klein, it's an unbelievable opportunity. He never thought he was going to play for the country of his birth. And he now gets an opportunity to get into a World Cup squad. Uh, Richie put a clip of Razi talking about it on Rugby Daily yesterday and he was basically making the point that in all the tournaments they've played and in the big test series that they've played, they've run out of locks and he talked about Lou Dieger getting injured in a World Cup final and he talked about somebody else, I think, uh, they still don't know about that's about whether or not he's going to be back and just made the point that the way they play is very attritional and they need loads of locks and he's a massive guy and they'd worked with him at Munster and they really liked the cut of his jib so I, I thought that he wouldn't make the South Africa World Cup squad but he probably will get some game time in the rugby championship or whatever that tournament is called these days yeah. and um, 
you know, I, I, I do think fair play to him for taking advantage of the rule change when it was clear that he wasn't going to play for Ireland. And Razzie said, in fairness to them, that they voted against the rule change, but that once the rule change was made, how can we benefit from this, was his words. And that's the, that's the ruthlessness of big-time professional sport, right? Absolutely. Um, there's no point, um, I, and, we, and we definitely have talked on this before, there's no point bemoaning um, the fact that there is a law that's in there and if other teams follow by it and you fall by the wayside, that's you, you, you can't allow that to happen. So it's an opportunity for for South Africa. I, look, I'm a little bit, I'm uncomfortable that we've um, Ben Healy, I've, the, the fear I have is he could end up kicking a 65 metre kick to uh, win a match against Ireland, which would frighten the life out of me or... Um, John Klein could come in and and, uh, and and be a changing force you know it's there are those sort of things do you mitigate against those or not well we haven't in, in, on either of those instances but it's um, look there are decisions that are made and you live you live by them but um, look you have to the laws that are put in there are put in there for a reason and they coaches coaches their ability to to exploit nuance in in law is what makes them good coaches yeah at so whatever they at their disposal i mean that's that is a harsh reality of profession sport one last thing i just wanted to ask you about was the uh, passing of paul randall um uh, yeah the uh, judge tell us about him because a lot of our uh, listeners and viewers this morning won't know too much about his playing career no, he played. He played eighties uh, in the very start of the nineties. I, I look. I never played against him. Um, uh, I met him on loads of occasions. He was, so one of the things I'd always mark out is a touch of quality. Um, Jason Leonard took over from um, uh, from the judge in. Uh, took his place but the two of them became unbelievable friends you know there were so I always met uh, I met Paul with Jason um, often and uh, that front row of, of Probe and Moore and, uh, and Randall were um, they, they ended up with a front row union club they used to uh, dinners and lunches in um, uh, in everywhere around the UK and the three of them stayed together forever so there were always great at regaling stories and everything but he was a he was a cracking player um, at a time when there weren't a huge number of matches every year um, um, I, I can't remember how many how many caps he got but it would have been about three or four times that if it was been playing if he was playing now but, 28 uh, 28 caps 28 yeah so that's it's through the 80s with only sort of four or five games uh, you know a year and um, now it's up at 10 or 12 a year so um, but he was look he was a good guy really good guy actually great, great fun great guy to have a pint with um, and he succumbed to motor neuron disease so that's another um, another uh, another one fallen which uh, which is very tough um, he got diagnosed I think very late on uh, in last year and his passing was very quick but he'll be sadly missed okay we'll leave it there Keith good stuff great to have you back thanks a million cheers Jen